Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Spark of Fury, featuring Tim Hermack. Tim Hermack is the founder and director of the Native Forest Council, based in Eugene, Oregon. Tim has been a forest defender since the late 80s, and at this point has ripened into a proper curmudgeon. We talked on January 9th, 2021, and our conversation covered his early days in the Sierra Club, Biden's dismal record, Clinton's betrayal of the forests, Gang Green, the big nonprofit environmental organizations based in D.C., the corrupting influence of money, the decline of the environment and of environmental regulations over the last 40 years, Colibri's early experiences with forest activism in Portland, hardcore tactics including the Earth Liberation Front, how industry has veto power over the content of school textbooks, the decline of media coverage of environmental issues, and the need to fight and fight hard to defend the forests. Shout out to Josh Schlossberg with his Green Root podcast, where I heard an interview with Tim Hermack and was inspired to invite him on this show. Check it out at greenrootpodcast.podbean.com. If you appreciate this episode, please share it on social media. If you're listening on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. To support this podcast financially, you can give a one-time donation at paypal.me slash colibri, or you can become a Patreon member at patreon.com slash colibri, where you'll get early access to most podcast episodes and other exclusive content. I love hearing from listeners, so feel free to contact me through radiofreesunroot.com. This introduction music is by Dr. Dream Chip of Portland, Oregon. To follow their work, see links in the show notes. Now here is my conversation with Tim Hermack, director of the Native Forest Council. You've been involved in environmental issues for a while at this point, since the 80s. Yeah, late 80s. Sierra Club then fought with the Sierra Club because they were too compromising and wouldn't take a stand, a line in the sand stand. All right. of my background was business and military. So you have very definite procedures. What's the problem? What's the solution? How do we get there? Well, hell, I couldn't even get the Sierra Club to say what the problem was. Logging sucks. It's all bad for the earth and nature and everything, including us that depend on it. And then, so we started up a newspaper and put inflammatory photographs, headlines, subheads. <laughs> you could read it 16 pages in two and a half seconds a page and get the drift. Sierra Club got mad when we used a headline that said, Hatfield misinformed. Our infamous senator was, he was very good on every issue except for logging. Warehouser put him in office and he paid him back throughout his career right but that was upsetting delegate negotiations with Hatfield by the Sierra Club which happened to be the Clinton salvage writer at the time right and they threatened to disenfranchise the Many Rivers group here in Eugene because we were rebels without a permission slip from right. San Francisco we even sued the Sierra Club for failing to abide by its own bylaws regarding board elections and they sued us and actually won uh, $87,000 slap suit judgment against seven people who happened to be a part of Sierra Club members for environmental ethics. Then David Brower, who I was working with on the, on the positive side, he said, Hermack, you're better at make, doing business. Just set up another organization, a nonprofit, 
and do what you keep saying the Sierra Club should do and show them. And right. we did. Uh, we had a lot of uh, monumental accomplishments, none of which ever did much more than deter the logging industry. In, uh, indeed, it just caused them to spend 10 times as much money in a lot tougher fashion for public relations, advertising, and influencing or owning politicians. And they have, like every industrial giant around the country, has come to dominate their legislatures, even the White House, most places. So we're pissing upstream and it doesn't work very well, but right. somebody's got to do it. We've got to do what we can, even when we don't see how we could possibly win. But we stopped sales and we saved timber sales. We did a lot of stuff. But today I'm 75 now. And I realize, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Truth doesn't seem to matter. Facts don't seem to matter. Ugly pictures don't seem to matter. It's the custom and culture of the United States, States to be apathetic sheep, getting our daily addiction satisfied through mass media propaganda. And, oh, we're going to hate those people and love these people. Wait, neither side of those are any good. They're all bad. They all listen and are owned by the influence of big money. Let, so, let's let's talk about that particular point for a moment, because you know now that uh, Trump is on his way out, or most likely, and Biden is on his way in, there are of course a lot of people who are like, "Oh, great, everything is going to be great now because there's a Democrat in the White House." So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you've observed. Well, all you got to do is look at Biden's 47-year record. All you got to do is look at his time during the Clinton years. The Patriot Act that he wrote, the tough on crime that he wrote, the ending welfare as we know it that he helped write. For crying out loud, Clinton's WTO, NAFTA, and GATT destroyed American manufacturing, sent all our factories and jobs to China. Why does any, including my mom and one of my brothers, think Biden's going to change now. We didn't, the left didn't influence Clinton. We didn't influence Obama. And both of them were better politicians than Biden. Biden's just a democratic version of Trump. Just a slightly different style. More anemic, more pathetic, less charismatic, less popular. Trump played to his base. Democrats in my 40 years never have. Never. They fuck their base and go with, well, we, we had to get Republican cooperation. Don't you know it? They're strong and we're weak. Well, we saw that during Clinton time with the 102nd Congress with Newt Gingrich. He was a, he was a small minority in the House. Clinton owned the House, the Senate. It was all Democrat. They had big, huge majorities. And because of their politics of appeasement of industry or subservience to industry, they lost votes. They lost elections. Let's, uh, I'd, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about uh, exactly what Clinton did, specifically the Northwest Forest Plan, because this is something that a lot of people don't know. Uh, and I'd heard bits and pieces of this. And then when I heard the interview with you on, on Josh's podcast, Green Root, I was, you know, sort of re-shocked or whatever you'd like to say about just how bad it was about the fact that when Clinton came into office, a judge had actually declared zero cut on public lands. And then Clinton turned that around. I think that's a really good story for people to hear. Yeah, nobody hears it because, frankly, gangrene never says it. Gang Green declared at the time the big establishment environmental groups headquartered in D.C. Uh, back then, it was just them. Today, it's even most of the grassroots, all been suborned by pure charitable trusts and industry donations to be reasonable, rational, and of limited effect. So the Greens all said it was a victory for the forest, this deal they cut, and the Northwest Forest Plan came up with 
eight options for logging. No forest preservation, just pablum for, well, we will leave a few trees. We'll only do restoration cuts. <clears throat> we'll only do meadow enhancement cuts, recreational benefit cuts, and we'll leave trees. We won't clear cut anymore. Bullshit. If you go look at the forest, everything is a clear cut in one form or another. Bunch of matchsticks that they leave behind. You look at all these fires. What did the first thing that the timber industry did was cut all the trees, green or not. It was salvage rider. Well, that's what Clinton did. He threatened the greens that if they didn't open, uh, if, if they held to that zero further logging of ancient forest by Judge Dwyer, that he would do a salvage rider and log it all. He did the same thing on that west western region of the Naval Petroleum Reserve in Alaska. He threatened them with a salvage rider on the on Anwar. Oh, oh, he'll do it. No, fight him. Let him do it. Don't agree to it, but they agreed to it and let him drill in the the even bigger and more pristine area of the Naval Petroleum Reserve. And now they're now Trump's running his trucks through that door. But this was the whole thing. Judge the the scientists, a hundred scientists got together and cobbled together a whole bunch of different forest plan options. And that wasn't good enough for the timber industry. And so uh, Clinton called together three scientists, three of the scientists, three of the hundred scientists. And over a weekend, they cobbled together three other plans one of which was option nine. And we, we intervened in court and said, this is illegal. If the spotted owl is already endangered because option nine logged 50% of the remaining uncut forest on national forest lands. 50%. 50%. And this is at a time when Judge Dwyer has already determined you can't log another stick. You've already cut too much. We're already suffering landslides, soil erosion, water pollution, fisheries loss, shade removal, making all of our upland streams too warm and impacting fish and wildlife, climate and weather. And Dwyer was agreeing with us and other people in the courts were agreeing with us but the gangrene, Wilderness Society, Audubon, Wilderness Society, and Sierra Club all supported lifting that restraining order by Judge Dwyer and agreeing to 50% more logging. We intervened in that court suit and we were winning, but then Judge Dwyer said, well, according to a preponderance of the plaintiffs, the big boys, some logging is okay. And if that's the case, I'm going to let it ride with industry discretion, forest service discretion to determine what's reasonable. Wait a minute, you already went through a trial, you already gave the injunction because you were shown that it was bad. And now look at it. 20 years later, there ain't much left. And the damn thing, damnedest thing is what we did with airplanes and cameras. You can now do it at your desktop on Google Earth. Bing Maps, Google Maps, all of them. And you pick the satellite imagery and look down and it's a holocaust. It's a war zone from horizon to horizon of the source for most of our nation's drinking water. The upland reaches of watersheds. We're destroying watersheds. We're destroying fisheries. We're causing climate change. When you think that the U.S. used to have a billion acres of forest, primeval forest, now we have less than 50 million in remnant pieces, bits, and patches. But all of that forest shade was gone. Much of it is still gone. All of industry's bogus propaganda that we pass as for as education. Well, we plant six for every one we cut. Bullshit. 
you don't plant sticks for every one you destroy. There's a million seedlings naturally occurring one inch tall in every forest. If you let them alone, don't poison them with pesticides and herbicides. The forest will grow naturally. God and nature gave us these forests. Tens of thousands of years of evolutionary upheaval, living, dying, decaying, and becoming soil nutrients for the next trees, living, dying, decaying, until pretty soon after 10,000 years, we might have had a forest with a thousand year old tree. It doesn't happen overnight. You can't grow a tree like a, a corn crop. So the picture you're painting here is one where, well, obviously the industry are villains because they're the ones who want to profit by going out there and destroying these habitats and, and you know, to turning them into, into resources. But also the villains here are the large environmental organizations, the big nonprofits based in D.C. that everyone has heard of. These are the people that, I mean, people see them quoted in the newspaper. They're like, oh, that's the good guys, you know? And so what you're saying is that these aren't the good guys. No, most anybody who's dependent on money is no longer pure. If you're a forest advocate or a nature defender, you don't get a lot of money. You do it because you believe it. And there's a passion that we have that burning fire inside our bellies, hearts, minds, spirits, and souls. We're fighting for it because we know what we're losing. And we know that all of their justifications is garbage. Plausible focus group de developed plausible bullshit. We, I, I was a logger when I was a teenager. Mm. You know, I love the smell of sawdust. Mm -hmm. And I love to cut firewood and burn it in the fireplace or the stove. But after a while, I went to Vietnam in 68 and 9. Then I went someplace in Portland for five years and someplace worse than Nam, Los Angeles, huh. for five years. And I've seen all over the place. What we're doing is insane. A billion acres of shade that's gone. Waters that are too warm. Bacteria and algae blooms that didn't used to occur because the water was too cold. Look what's going on to us. And now we're looking at climate catastrophes. We're looking at wildfire catastrophes, 75% of which occurred in logged over replanted areas or in prairies, not much of which exists anymore. We used to have 95% of our tall grass prairies are gone. Nearly 95% of all of our uncut trees are gone. You want to see a big tree, you go to a picture book or a museum. I mean, this is insane. And it's the little groups now. You know, $100,000 from a foundation to a little group will guarantee the fact that they have a reasonable, responsible, not too upsetting message. This timber sale is bad, but Timber sales in total aren't bad. Right. That's their message. So if you cut anything in half, repeatedly over time, it becomes zero. Half of a half of a half of a half becomes zero. And whereas Teddy Roosevelt locked up the National Forest Preserves, he called them, and for bad logging, even called out the cavalry to shoot the five-fingered thieves that were sometimes sneaking out trees that they cut down. FDR followed a similar path for quite a while. The History of Conservation under FDR was an excellent book, but he had tremendous cabinet members. I haven't seen an administration with such a cabinet since. You know, they were all Eugene Debs and Friedrich Douglass, big, powerful cabinet members, Henry Wallace, Francis Perkins, Marsh. Geez, he had some grand people. Hell, his wife, Eleanor. They were excellent people. We haven't had an excellent politician since. I mean, one that has a heart for people, one who defends the country, not the 1%. 
Right. That's what I'm afraid my influence has caused. More expenditures and a more ironclad lock on the areas where we might have had access to justice. They all bought up the media. They bought up the judges. They bought up the politicians. I used to get good journalists who would listen to our rational arguments and the pictures and the graphs and agree with us. Washington Post editor, New York Times editor. But it was gangrene at the time, National Wildlife, Audubon, Wilderness, and Sierra Club that went behind me every time I visited a congressional office and got them to agree to support the, the National Forest Protection Acts, five bills that would basically stop any further logging and the recovery, desperately working together, even with our enemies, to recover what we had lost. We took care of workers. We took care of the communities. We took care of the, the all the workers and people. But the four congressional representatives within those four green groups went behind me and told them if they did that, they could never support them again. Sierra Club is a big, powerful political influence from the supposed left. Rock Evans, he, he, he admitted it. Jim Johns, a congressman at the time, he told me why he had to reverse his position with me. Well, it was too expensive. Everybody, I knew industry would be mad at me. I didn't realize the green groups would be mad at me too, he said. So that's the nature of the beast. Here in Oregon, we don't have one zero cut environmental group anymore. Wow. We, we have some groups that fight for economic justice, which tend to nibble at it. If you had honest and fully costed replacement cost accounting of a tree, you would never, ever cut it down. If you put that penny on a chessboard, doubling it for every single square, pretty soon you're at more money than exists on earth. That's how it compounds. Well, the one factor they never consider in current fraudulent economics and accounting practices, which apply to most all Fortune 500 companies. Trees are worthless. They grow so we can cut them down. Oh, even if they're on your property, they're mine, says the logging parasites. Uh, but if you had honest counting, and you said, what does it cost? What's the value to replace this tree that we're cutting down? A thousand year old tree is in the trillions of dollars at the current cost of planting a tree at six or seven bucks and then waiting for it to grow as if it could on depleted soil, another thousand years old. It can't happen, but even if it could, the time value of money says you, we wouldn't be stupid enough to cut this tree down to make toilet paper. Ancient old growth forests to make toilet paper. And newsprint and catalogs and junk mail. Oh, and houses that last 40, 50 years if you take care of them. And like we go to, we went to paradise after the fire and tried to persuade them all to grow, to replace those burned down homes with non-flammable products, steel framing, steel siding, steel roofs. You could have made houses impervious to fires, but at the same time, they didn't, the carpenters, home builders, all these people came in and told the insurance companies that couldn't handle that. And it was, a they threatened war with insurance and politicians and anybody else that insisted on non-flammable structures in wildland urban interface. Go figure. I think that people have the impression that because they hear words like sustainability, 
because of the green washing that comes from the, the corporations and also from the nonprofit groups, they have this idea that like, well, since the environmental movement started with the first Earth Day in 1970, everything's just been getting better. I feel like that's the impression that your uh, typical liberal who cares, you know, and does, you know, actually care, but th this is the impression that they, that they have. And yet, and, and when you, we really look at it, even though the programs that were put in during the Nixon administration, the, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, all these, even though the EPA, even though those did, well, I, I believe they did initially at least lead to some improvement, they may be peaked sometime in the 70s, right? I mean, it, was, it, was, it didn't take long for them to start getting chipped away. Very true. Um... I've watched that chipping away and I've watched the green groups fall. You know, they came up with stewardship contracting. They came up with watershed councils to more control the narrative and insist on the dominance of logging as the solution to all each and every problem caused by too much logging. But right. they've pounded that through. If you look at every watershed council I participated in, 30 people, uh, only three of which were environmentals, and almost always they were moderate, reasonable, compromising, collaborating environmentalists. Maybe not the biggest groups, but some green person that would work with them, abide by their desires. You know, 27 of them were city, county, state, federal agencies, or industry reps. And hell, one industry rep in a group of 30 civil, considerate, careful, empathetic environmentalists, one timber industry lobbyist can eat their lunch. They're ruthless, they come with a fist and unlimited pockets of money. Whereas the three green people, they're just a tool or a shill for cutting more and more and more. So everything I have seen, I don't see anything in summation at the crux of all of our problems. Corporate dominance is still there. Uh, their ownership of the all access to justice, they still own it all, more so than every year than they did the year before. You know, look how quickly Biden is backwatering. Oh, look at all of his appointments. Some of them are as hideous as, and professional hideous than Trump's. We will lose more forests, more nature, more clean air and water under a, a Democratic administration than we ever did under a Republican. The last big Republican we fought with was Nixon, and he became according to the bills he signed, the best environmental president we've had in 40 years. Oh, 50 at this point. Yep. God damn it. Anyhow, there's always hope. As long as one person has a hope and that spark of fury and righteous indignation and outrage, something positive can occur. I've spent all of my family inheritance, I've spent everything we had trying to save what's left of the national forest and just adopt an honest discussion. What are the pros and cons of logging? What are the consequences, negative? What are the benefits, positives? If you actually did that, who the hell wants a job at Auschwitz as a prison guard torturing and killing people? Well, the same thing. Who would want a job cutting down what's left of our forest and watersheds? We already know all the fisheries don't want that forest cut. Our water, fresh water, ocean water, it's all being affected. And dams, it's all being affected by logging. You know, why should Simplot be getting a billion dollars of water free every year from the federal government by damming the Snake River so that he can grow potatoes in the goddamn desert? Right. That's what we do. Oh, and what's the damage to a, 
a, a natural forest environment from cattle grazing, bovine bulldozers. Just look at the aerials where there's grazing and where there isn't. Right. What a difference. You know, God or nature gave us paradise. We, we've slaughtered the Indians so we can steal it. And well, what, what have we done with it? Contrary to their reverence for nature, we're destroying it all. Nature and life for fraudulent corporate profits. They're the problem. And no green groups wants to take it on. Yeah, given uh, given the stakes and given how bad the situation is, it seems like the tactics that we're considering, we should be considering almost anything, really. And I'll say that when I first moved to Portland, Oregon, it was in the spring of 2001, and I just happened to move in on Clinton across the street from the Cascadia Forest Alliance. And I'd lived in the Midwest and the East Coast, and I knew nothing about forest issues, but I moved in across from these kids, and they were fun, and I, I really enjoyed them. And I was involved with Indie Media, the Independent Media Center, which you may or may not remember from that time. I do. Right. And so, yeah. And so, yeah, we were like the, the anarchist media. Right. And so, so I got involved with them and I started going out to the forest with them. And, and so I was doing stories for indie media and video and photos of, of the, the different campaigns they were doing and the tree sits. I got to go up in a tree sit. And I, I tell you, going up into a tree sits really, that's one of the most remarkable experiences I've ever had was just was being up there, like the, the views, but also just the feeling and, and, I mean, it, it was amazing. And so I was, uh, mostly I was uh, doing my work there around the solo timber sale, which actually did end up getting saved. But before that was the end of the Eagle Creek campaign. And I wasn't really involved with that one myself. I came in right at the end, but there was a friend of mine who you've probably heard of named Trey Arrow. I knew him at that time. I didn't know everything he was up to, but you know, we're still friends. And so later on, he was able to tell me everything that he had done. He went out with some friends and they set some logging trucks on fire at a timber company that was working on Eagle Creek. And well, the way that some people tell the story, they're like, well, after that, there were like no mills that wanted to take the wood from this timber sale because they were afraid they would get targeted next. And eventually, I guess it was a judge maybe that shut it down. But some people have attributed the success of that to this particular tactic in this particular case. I, th I think that's quite true. I think what the ELF did, Earth Liberation Front and all of its people and all of the Earth Firsters that would be aligned, hell, even of some people who were considered themselves moderate. I despise the word moderate, but personally, I, I think people should be extreme left and or extreme right. I call myself a social liberal and a financial or economic conservative. I demand that things pencil out. Does spending this dollar for this make sense? Or if I spend a dollar for this, for that, will I cost myself another hundred dollars downstream because of that expenditure? Right. That's a cost benefit analysis. Well, they never, ever, nobody does it that I can find in the United States. Uh, green scissors, that offshoot in D.C., where they were supposedly taking environmental economic analysis of things. They would talk about cash flow. No, that's only a monetary measure. What's life worth, you guys? That's what's at stake. It's all connected. But that kind of a cost-benefit analysis, people have a hard time with. And I ask them, if you had this place and it was in your backyard, it was your backyard, and you asked somebody to come in and, and thin it, you know, to, for whatever reasons, and they took everything, would you let them come back for another place? Hell no. But that's what logging does. You know, you can give them this postage stamp of a timber sale where they cut everything down. But then they take big merchantable trees they can snake out of the surrounding boundary areas. You know, we've demonstrated that. And what do they get? Anybody go to jail? No, they just get a fine. What was the fine? 6,000 bucks. <laughs> the tree was worth 100,000 bucks or 50,000 bucks. 
or and its replacement cost was many, 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 many hundred million bucks. Right, because the regulatory agencies that set up these fines, they were, of course, that whole process with setting up what, how much the fine is going to be and all that, the industry is involved with that itself, too. Yeah, it's a negotiated settlement. Oh, the guy you found guilty, he gets a say in how much the fine is? <laughs> right. <laughs> what the hell? Some deterrent. No deterrent at all. Right. They own the courts. They own the news. They own the media. They own, hell, Project Learning Tree controls what textbooks are taught in our K-12 through schools. They own the Texas and California uh, school of boards, school boards that determine which books they will choose and select. I talked to uh, Hill and Holton, no, Holt Scientific, a book, textbook uh, corporation at the National Science Teachers Association convention. And I asked him if he made any books that I could endorse. He, he laughed uproariously. Hmm. This is a guy in his silver-haired 60s, three-piece suit, distinguished, debonair. He, he thanked me and said, that's the first laugh I've had in two days of this foot-killing convention. <laughs> he said, not only do we not make a book you would like, anytime we make a book that any industry thinks it's going to be hurt by, we let them change it to suit themselves. Then and only then do we actually print and publish and distribute the book. That right. was a so shocker. So you're talking about the types of books that, you know, like grade school or high school students would be, would be right. getting. Textbooks, things right. that talk about uh, biology and ecology, anything that implied that logging was harmful to our survival was not allowed. When I started this, like I was saying with the Post and the New York Times and others, lots of respect. We had a front page story on, in the Atlantic Magazine, uh, mismanagement of the national forests. Not one of them will publish a story our way, which is acerbic, aggressive, assertive, confident, and simplistically right on its face. They won't do it. When Ted Turner made the movie R Rage Over Trees, PBS wouldn't run it. His advertisers refused to advertise or to pay for advertising on the program. He was stubborn and rich enough that he said, screw it, I'll run it anyway. And he ran it on other channels. But today, I can't get our point of view. Uh, my local KLCC public radio, the manager there, I asked him, how come his stories were always giving the destruction of nature equal time or worse, greater time than they gave the people trying to defend nature, protect, preserve and protect? He said, Hermac, 70% of our money comes from the timber industry. 70%. While the politicians, the corporate-owned politicians in Congress are defunding Amtrak, defunding NPR, PBS, that affects us. And so we've had to rely greater and greater on corporate money. Willamette Industries president was the president of this, the OPB Foundation. His son, 30 years later, became president of that foundation. He said, we'll never run a story that we would like to run. We won't show the pictures. I fought with most, most of the Northwest publications. Seattle Times did a, a five-part series on logging. And as good as it was, it was also good for the timber industry. It's just like a, a political bill that passes Congress. You can read almost anything you want in it or out of it. Discouraging, isn't it? 
I mean, I, it seems like our situation is, I mean, environmentally is worse than it's ever been. And our situation politically is worse than it's ever been as well. Not only can we tolerate no further logging, we've got to get forests back. So your logging level is this. We want you to put this much back. You know, not really. I don't really don't want them to plant a fiber farm seedling from some hybrid nursery. Right. I want God and nature to bring whatever it wants back. That's the only faith or confidence I have that the forests will recover. Just stop doing the harm. Well, most green groups don't do that. They won't talk about stopping it at its source. Project or corporate personhood, Richard Grossman at Poclad, Program on Corporations, Law and Democracy, was great at it. The corporations are not people. Money is not speech. Hartman wrote a book similar, Unequal Capital or something. And he too was talking about it. There are economists in this country, Jim Carr, uh, John Talberth up in Portland. There are a number, I can't recall, but I think there's a dozen that are talk, preach economics the way I'm talking about it, honest and fully costed. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. Excuse me, you were about to say something. Oh, I, I was just asking about the book that you held up. Yeah, Organized to Win. Yeah, yeah. What's that one about? Well, are you familiar with Eugene Debs? Yeah, somewhat. Yeah, he was the socialist and anti-war organizer from the, about 100 years ago. Yep. And Huey Long, uh, a lot of people. Who, Ray Rogers, who was a textile union organizer, he laid it out. You show your objective. What's the problem? Well, here it is. This is your objective. How are we going to get there? Well, you're not going to get there by aiming direct at it. Go for all the different people that entity, corporation, depends on. It's banks, it's insurance companies, it's law firms, it's ad agencies, all these different people, and start exposing them for the evils of what this corporation is doing. They aren't used to or think they should have to defend themselves from scorn. Well, the timber industry, the headquarters, they're paid. They, they know what this is. They don't care. And he organized things and they've accomplished things. It's basically doing the grassroots work like Bernie Sanders team did, you know, mm -hmm. pounded on doors, talked. Why? People bought it. You know, basically disproving everything the establishment politicians claim. We have to get corporate money. No, you don't. And how do you get money that isn't corporate? By inspiring, electrifying, giving them dreams and positive goals that will actually help them in their lives. Health, education, and welfare, infrastructure. We're not only liquidating nature, we're just, we're start we're taking all of the country's money and giving it to wars well over a trillion every year and and here's the way it is it's a corporate vampire the corporate predator predatorial virus plague plague of capitalists worshiping money and nothing else caring about money and nothing else that's why we've lost our forests air and water fish and wildlife, insects, soil. I think it was 20, 25 years ago when David Brower and Lester Brown uh, Economic Policy Institute or something like that said, you know, 95% of our top groundwater or prairies are gone, tall grass prairies. 95% of our rivers are no longer undammed. You know, We've lost 90 at the time, percent of our forests, 70% of all the forests worldwide. Groundwater, 70% gone or polluted. Aquifers, gone or polluted. 
you're familiar with that down in the four corners where they were pumping million year old fossil water to make a, a liquid that, so they could send powdered coal to the other end power plant. That's obscene. Yeah. It, it was just everything is everything we do is liquidating the savings account and claiming its income. When the savings account or future income revenues or future survivability, we're liquidating all of that. It's not just our stolen future. It's our destroyed future. So they can get a few more subsidized prof fraudulent profits that they don't pay taxes on. That's our country, the whole blasted country. So many of our churches pray your way to wealth. The fastest growing ones are televangelists. And 16 of them have private jets, live in multi-million dollar mansions. Now, what are we all crazy? Everything is being corrupted from within and without. And somehow we are going to monkey wrench that damn machine until we shut the country down with a national sit-down strike. Left and right together, we're all in it together. We're all on the same Titanic. When the Titanic goes down, we're all going to get hurt. Even the mega rich, the stupid, stupid, stupid people who think they can eat their money. Who's going to grow your food, Dexter? Who's going to wash your toilets for you? You really want a house with 16 bathrooms? Anyhow. We've got to, the only thing I know, Deb said it, that's the whole idea of a strike, you know, is to make the corporation care about your demands as workers. Honesty, fairness, and justice for all. It's got to be in there somewhere. And when we realize that's the flagpole we're rallying around, that's the flag we're flying. Give me liberty or give me death. Hell, give me honest, fair, and just or death. Politicians that lie, corrupt, hurt, harm, the 99% should be hung. Guillotine, I don't care. Fed to the pigs, sent to Guantanamo. you got to stop tolerating people lying to us. Well, he's a Democrat and he's better than the Republicans. Yeah? Go look at their records. The Republicans look bad. The Democrats look friendly. And the Democrats have quietly signed off on further and further losses of everything we care about and hold dear. Yeah, I could rant all blasted day. <laughs> well, I get wound up, but I see certain things happening that are beneficial, but you can see how quickly they get suborned by money, the legalized bribery and extortion with which money is, money is used. Well, if, if, if you would help us with this difficulty, uh, I think we could pay you a lot of money. If you keep impeding or obstructing our efforts to try to stay alive, uh, you won't get any money. And indeed, we will spend money to hurt you, blacklist you, whatever. It works. I've had one house fire in 96. I was trapped in a forest fire at the East Davis Lake fire of 2003. My family was almost incinerated. It was arson. Human cause was all we could get out of the forest service, but they know it was arson. At wow. the only ingress egress point, you couldn't get out. Luckily, after about an hour and a half, the winds changed. And it blew away from us and allowed the Forest Service to get us out. And 30 minutes after that, that place was closed off again and became much worse. I've been had my life threatened dozens of times. And I tell them, I hope you shoot straight, because I know I do. <laughs> you know, I am not a pacifist. I believe, I believe in peace. But you can't have peace. If you're a doormat, ever, if you can't fight, stand up, scream. I don't care what we do, but you can do something. I ask people, what would you do if you came out the front door and someone was strangling your cat? Would you call your priest, your pastor? 
A cop? A lawyer? No, you would kill the son of a gun. You would wail on him. You wouldn't think, well, could I win? Will I get hurt? No, you do it because it's demanded of you. It's what's right. And when we stop listening to the boob tube making us all indoctrinated stupids and realize Democrat and Republican, the 99% of them, they're all with us. We're all on the same page. As Bernie demonstrated when he packed auditoriums with people from all walks of life, including in red communities, red states. The truth has power. Keep it simple and tell the truth. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.